Good afternoon, my name is Klaus Soderberg and uh, I'm the captain on the uh, Norwegian Dreamliner DY70872 Los Angeles International Airport. My colleagues on the flight deck today is Relief Captain Pat Okeman and, uh, and First Officer Oliver Miller. Uh, we have uh, good weather both here at Stockholm and as well in Los Angeles. En route weather seems also to be very good and flight time is estimated to 10 hours and 30 minutes. Shortly we will be boarding the aircraft uh, with the, our colleagues and we will do their uh, joint briefing to update them on basically the same things that I just mentioned. Thank you. Good afternoon ladies and gentlemen. My name is Klaus, Swedish I am. And uh, the guys in the cockpit with me today is... I'm Oliver Miller. And I'm Pear. I come in and I'm here. Yeah. So Pear will be the relief captain today, meaning that uh, Oliver will be sitting in the right-hand seat for takeoff and landing. Okay, uh, Los Angeles it is. Out of Stockholm, you've noticed already, good weather. I believe it's going to be runway 19. That means uh, not a long taxi, but uh, you will not be in any problem whatsoever. The crossing looks on paper to be nice. Not that much turbulence as it is uh, on our information. But as you know uh, yourselves, anything can happen, right? So. Let's be careful out there, okay? Los Angeles uh, is awaiting us with also good weather. Possibly a lot of traffic going in, so uh, flight time is expected 10 hours, 30 minutes. And with that flight time, I have added about five minutes for the little bit extra approach time. We are in LNF Foxtrot. No snags, airplane should be good. It came from maintenance this morning and um, that's about it. The cockpit door is locked only for the passengers, so anytime you have some uh, minutes extra to uh, chat or just check out what we're doing, please feel free to come up. And that's about it. Guys, do you have anything else? No. no. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, any questions? Anything else? We have about one hour till departure. 287 passengers. That was correct. Yeah. 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 So almost full. You'll be busy. You'll be busy. Okay, so full house we can say. Okay, and that's it. We've got one wheelchair today. One wheelchair, so we need to request that. Yes, please. Okay, yeah. we'll do. Okay, anything else? Let's go to work. Awesome. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So my name is Pierre Ackerman, and I'm the relief captain on uh, this uh, Boeing 787 for Norwegian to Los Angeles today. And we're going to do a walk around to make sure that everything looks good on the outside. Okay? So normally we start here and we check in for all the static and the ports that nothing is blocked, that we have no dent in these areas around here. And we continue all the way around. And then we continue down here, we check that the vents are open. You can feel the air blowing out from the cabin. We check in the conditions of the tires, and you can have some hydraulics come down for the gear, come up and down. So we check for any hydraulic leaks. We also check the inside that everything is looks good. All the lights are okay. All the cables, no leaks, and the same with the tire in front. And then we have for the dynamic air, we have the different sensors. We check that they are not blocked on both sides of the aircraft. And then normally I go up and I look in front of the nose to see if you see if there's any, anything I've been hitting the nose. We continue looking for all the veins that we have and that all the latches are closed, that's supposed to be closed. And we have the static ports on the other side.
And then we come back and we basically check the same thing on the main tires as we do on the front. This is the difference for the Dreamline now. This used to be hydraulic for the brakes, which now is electric. So it's no hydraulic wire, it's electric wire. And then you can see here how we check the brakes when we're coming here later on. We have these brake wear indicators. Just make sure that we have brake pads. So they will go in to be flush. And you have them on every side. You have two here, two there, and all the way around. And same thing with the engine. We look here, we have no leaks. It's dry. There shouldn't be any oil anywhere. I'll take a look at the fan blades, that we have no cracks in them or any jack or anything. continue and then we look in the shape of the wing and we make sure that it's there, no dents. Uh, for any interest, if, if you for any reason we need to dump fuel, it's the pipe coming out there in the wing where we will dump the fuel for jettison. And when we're coming to the tail, we're looking for the same thing. We're making sure there are no dents in the tail section on the fin or on the elevator. And that we have all the static wigs sitting on the trailing edge. Coming to this side, we're looking for the same thing as we did on the other side around. We're looking for the tires, the brakes, no leaks, and especially for the hydraulic part. And this is a good sign, we start fueling anyhow, so that's good for us. And today we're going to put on 59.9 tons of fuel to Los Angeles. And on the second end, if you're looking for the same thing, the first one, we don't want to see any leaks or anything. It should be dry and nice. No dents in it, no doors open. And that was a little harder. On the old airplanes, the 7.3, we used to be able to stop it by hand. But I don't know if going to try this one. So we try to look as good as we can and make sure there's no cracks or any dents in uh... That's it. Now you're done a quick walk around on the 7A7 Dreamliner. Okay, so uh, when we've entered the flight deck, we've just uh, checked all the documents are on board and uh, I've secured the aircraft and then I've entered in the, uh, the departure and the arrival airport and then requested the routes. Uh, so I set up the FMC and done a performance calculation on the electronic flight bag. And then I've set up the overhead panel, making sure 
before the uh, essential items are on. And now I'm just waiting for the captain to finish his duties and then we'll check our performance and get the up to date load sheet and uh, finalize the computers ready for takeoff. While Oliver has set up the cockpit regarding the um, route, a little bit of the performance and uh, runways and etc., I have done my part, a lot less I can say, but um, now we have received the uh, preliminary load sheet. That is um, something that we use to uh, get a little bit ahead of, uh, of the game and later on we will get the, um, the final load sheet. That's the, the one that we use for the final uh, calculations and also to upload into the FMC that calculates our speeds, etc. And uh, on this one, uh, of course, there's the basic things like date, aircraft, flight number, and then we go into a little bit more specific, like a date, uh, route and destination. Uh, again, the uh, uh, tail number, and here we have a very important thing, that's the crew on board, three in the cockpit and eight in the cabin. And zero fuel weight, we have uh, take of fuel, take of weight, and uh, also this one, landing weight. These are the actual ones, as for now, but again, as I said, it's only the preliminary. So what we do now is to uh, put in the takeoff weight into our EFB electronic flight bag, and we calculate, but we do not send it over to the FMC. So here we can see what uh, airport we have, what runway I've selected, where I expect the departure, the takeoff roll to begin, and uh, conditions of the runway, present wind, outside air temperature, and uh, pressure, Q&H, in Q&H, hectopascals. These are all manually changed if, if I'd like to, or some of them I can copy from the FNC that Oliver just put in. And um, here's also the flap setting, the, um, uh, the rating, and um, V1, VR, the speeds, any ice, if I want to improve climb, a little bit of the performance, won't go into that more deeply now, and in case our reverses are not inoperative or either one is inoperative. Today they are both operative. And the expected takeoff weight and the CG, the center of gravity, how the aircraft is balanced. And then I just, if I don't have anything else, I could have uh, no times, notification to airmen. For instance, if the runway is shortened or if I have an obstacle somewhere, I will go into this page and insert them for the um, performance and calculations to be correct. Now, now I don't have anything of that, so I can just push the calculation button and that's already done. And therefore this page, this box pops up. It tells me what aircraft it is and what engines I have and what flap setting this one uh, recommends. The acceleration height in case we get an engine failure. Furthermore, what runway it's uh, calculating of and this one should be matching that one, of course. And takeoff gross weight, that one should be matching that one. And then we have... Uh, that we could actually derate. The engines are not used fully powered. Not even with this weight, we don't have to full uh, go with full thrust. And we have also uh, a selected temperature, so we, we tell the engines that it is actually warmer than it is in order to save the engines. They also reduce a little bit, and therefore we save it. With all these um, inputs, it now has calculated a V1 speed. That's the speed where we decide if we continue the, the flight, or the takeoff, I should say more accurately, or stop. And VR, that's a rotation speed. That is when uh, Oliver now tells me rotate, then I will start the rotation and bring the airplane into the air. V2, 158 knots, that's a safe climb out speed. And uh, these ones will later, when I get the final load sheet, will be sent here. I'm not sure if it's be able, uh, able to be seen, but it says uh, send output. If I push that one, I will, could select send to FMC. Uh, if I now push complete, it will be transferred. It will be sent to the FMC. And we then can complete the uh, pre-flight checks. But now I don't because I don't have the final load sheet. Cancel. But it brings me uh, an idea of can I go? Is there any anything that restricts me? Or can I continue? 
uh, in this case I can continue. And also this V2 speed that I pointed out, uh, right now 158, I will put that in the speed window of the MCP, mode control panel. They should be the same, they are the same actually. And that's it. So what we do now, we are going to get ourselves uh, clearance for departure. We are waiting for the boarding, it's taking place right now. And when we have gotten the clearance, we can do the uh, departure briefing. And um, we can uh, check that everything is correct in the FMC according to our clearance. And then we just wait for the final load sheet. When we have re received the final load sheet, we want that to uh, match with the numbers that we have on board given to us by either the uh, handling agency or the uh, purser, Billy Jean is her name today. So, uh, and that's it. And if um, if anything changes, like if the weather, it is uh, weather for Stockholm, if that changes, we will update accordingly. And that's it. So we can either request the departure clearance by, by voice or by ACARS. And we can do that by clicking here on flight information. And then uh, departure clearance request. And make sure these fields are all filled in, um, which I did earlier. And then we click send. And then all being well, we should get a message back from Stockholm with our clearance. So the clearance has just popped up here. So we're cleared to Los Angeles from runway 19 right by the Kogav 4 Golf. I'm initially to 5,000 feet, which is set here. And squawk 5045, next frequency 121.7. So I can change the squawk now. 5045, that's set. So uh, now we've got our departure clearance. The captain, when he's ready, can brief us for the departure. Excellent. Very good. We start with the weather for Stockholm. It's information echo. It says uh, departure on with 19 right. Yeah. And met report uh, 200 degrees, 7 knots, variable between 190 and 340. So we could do a little up, uh, update of the performance before we send it. 10 kilometers, cloud scattered 4100 uh, feet, temperature 21, and dew point 12, QNH 1003. Check. I'll keep it over here until you want it, Oliver. There are no no times for uh, Stockholm. And uh, departure clearance said uh, clear to uh, Los Angeles, off 19 right, Koga 4 Golf in FMC, yeah. altitude 5,000 feet, squawk 5045, next frequency 1217, HS Echo, that's the one I just read. Yeah. QNH again 1003, uh, TSAT 1210, that's. We expect, very good, I'll keep that over here also. Uh, we expect to taxi out from spot uh, 17, push back facing west, and then we expect the second right on Yankee, and all the way up to 19 right, Yankee 10. Yeah. Agree on that? Yeah. Or we follow the uh, HC, of course. So we don't lock ourselves into this one. Uh, long dry runway, 3,301 meters, and we expect flaps five, and, and then we go to Koga for Golf. There we have that one, and I want to be on that one. It says on page 10, three Papa, 18th of March, 2011, uh, MSA Arlanda VOR in our departure sector 1700 feet. Highest uh, 2200. Yeah. So we climb 3000 in case. Stockholm Control 12410 when instructed, transition altitude 5000 feet. Koga 4 Golf says uh, 250 below 100. That should be in there, 250 below 100. And um, 186, nothing else. Uh, says Koga 4 Gold, Climber 186 tractor SA705 in FMC, 600 and uh, plus yeah. 220 knots, then SA707, yeah. 220 with 1500 or above, yeah. uh, slightly right to SA706, 
855 and then to Korgav. Correct? Yeah. Very good. Again, initial climb clearance 5000. That's set in the FNC. Engine failures uh, before 80 knots. Uh, all the 10 items stated in the QRH. After 80 knots, prior V1, four items. Engine failure, engine fire, predicted wheelchair or clearly unsafe or unable to fly. And I call stop. Thrust levers to idle. Auto throttle disconnect. Verify max braking, reverser, and speed brake. We stop on the runway. Yeah. If we can, I'll set the parking brake. We go uh, camera crew at your stations. But also, if there's nothing bad, we can taxi off to the left. That'll be. And um, if there are any uh, memory items, you will perform them on my command. And uh, if we are on fire, if we have a fire, we assess the situation. And if we decide to evacuate, we will uh, follow the um, evacuation checklist on the flip side of the QRH. Yeah. Okay? And you have some items? Yeah, if you call stop, I will note the brakes on speed, call speed brakes up or speed brakes not up, thrust reverse is normal, or no thrust reverser left, or no thrust reverser right, or no reverses. Verify your actions are complete, call any emissions, call 60 knots, auto brake disarm, and uh, inform me to see the rejects. And uh, after V1, we check thrust, pulse rate, gear up, climb protection schedules. We have no emergency uh, turns. We straight at 3,000 feet. Yep. Good weather here in Stockholm. Most likely return. Uh, weather's good. Several runways, and we go for 19 right. Only time that we are in a hurry is if we have a fire on, on uh, engines or the APU that yep. doesn't go out. Then we wait for nothing. Immediate return. We do as much as we can and come back. Okay? Yep. Anything else? Uh, nothing to add. Okay, very good. pre flight checklist. Pins and covers. They are removed. Oxygen. Tested 100%. 100% right. pre flight checklist complete. Checked. Uh, the route is already put in. Uh, Oliver um, requested it from the company and it's been uploaded. Uh, one requirement for the uh, crossing of the Atlantic is that we check the, um, the route and track and distances on the crossing itself. We will do it now and also later, of course, when we have uh, received the oceanic clearance. So right now we're just checking the route and the distances and the total distance also. Okay? Okay, so the route is from Echo Sierra Sierra Alpha to Kilo Lima Alpha X-Ray. Okay, Oliver, are you ready for uh, weight yeah. and balance? Yeah. 08, 15, 14 LNF and 787, low sheet final, edition 1, 787, 15th of August, Arn LAX, LNF, 3 and 8, zero fuel weight, 1, 4, 5, decimal 3. Check. Takeoff weight is what, do you have? Uh, 205.2. Check, plus the um, taxi. taxi. Landing weight, 1536, that's below maximum. Passengers, 281, and Mac. Take away 25.5. Very good. So let's get one of these to you. Thank you very much. And we may close. Where's Neil Jean? See you next time. Okay, yeah, I've got my yep. figures. Take off cross weights 205,000. D rate TO 74.3. Selected temperature 36. V1 one, 149er, VR 152, and V2 158 knots. That checks. Checked. Sun output to F and C. Hopefully that will pop up there very soon. Okay, so I've got flaps five, uh, derated at 36 degrees. And V1 149, VR 152, V2 158. So, accepting that? Yep. And CD trims 375, smack on, how about that? Performance tracks. Very good. Uh, North Shuttle 7087, stand 17, with information echo, uh, request push and start. North Shuttle 7087 Heavy, good afternoon, start and push is approved and uh, do not block for uh, inbound and outbound traffic on the other side of the apron when pushing. Push and start approved and do not block the inbound and outbound traffic, North Shuttle 7087 Heavy.
Ground copy. We are cleared for push and start, but they request us not to block for uh, the Sulu Golf for uh, the domestic terminal. Uh, okay, on gate 34, I guess. Yeah, most likely. Okay. Sure, uh, brakes are released. Come brakes, are, push back. brakes are released. Uh, you can start 2 and 1 in sequence. Copy that. We'll start uh, 2 and 1 in sequence. Oliver, start right engine. And start left engine. Yeah, now we have uh, selected the uh, start for the both engines. This airplane is able to start both engines at the same time, only on electrical power. So, uh, Oliver selected the start switches to uh, start, and then I put the fuel control switches to run. And on this engine control panel, we can see that it says auto start for the N2 rotation. That's one of the stages in the engine that is called N2. And now we just sit and watch, and uh, in case the engine don't want to start up, it will try to relight and restart. We see that the uh, exhaust gas temperature is rising, so something is happening in, on both engines. We have N3 also another stage, and fuel flow, oil pressure, oil temperature, oil quantity, and vibrations. So they are all rising. The uh, fuel flow should be steady, which it is. Oil pressure will slightly rise, and oil temperature will also rise as uh, as the startup sequence continues. N1, the first. Uh, fan that you can see when looking into the engine has now started to r rotate and the T-pair, the torque, has also been um, lit up. Here we have uh, two green lights running, both run in, uh, engines are running. Um, still doing with nothing else. Up here in the roof you can see the start switches has gone back to normal and now we just wait for the pushback to be completed. Yes, go ahead. Okay, pushback complete. Set brakes please. This is the ACAS panel, very good. Parking brake is set, so I can report. Ground cockpit? Yep. Parking brake is set. Okay. And ground cockpit? Yep. We had uh, two good starts, you may disconnect. Thank you, have a nice flight. Thank you very much. Bye bye. See you on the right? Yes. Thank you, bye bye. Bye. Flaps five. We nowadays start up uh, the airplane with the center tank fuel pumps off because of a, uh, a bulletin from Boeing and now we can see that the center tank is uh, feeding both engines. Uh, is it there? There he is. Thank you very much. And we want the... that one we want to have. This is not a requirement for us to look at this one, but the Boeing pilots does and will do. So I'd like to look at it too. Ready for rudders? Very good. Before taxi checklist. Request taxi. North Shuttle 7087 Heavy, request taxi. North Shuttle 7087, taxi holding point 19 right. Taxi holding point 19 right, North Shuttle 7087. Holding point 19 right, four, six, straight ahead, second one, to the right, two minutes left. as briefed. Straight ahead, full runway. The tower 1185, point. 
You know I can tax on the yellow line, I'm sure. You tax on the side of it? Yeah. Still waiting for the cabin ready. Marshall, uh, 7087, uh, number 3 for departure, tower 118.5. Roger, that's uh, 118.5, North Shuttle 7087. There we go, camera ready. Excellent. Please be seating the cabin. Line up uh, one Before line up one right for Yankee Niner. Checklist complete. Stockholm Pair, North Shuttle 7087, ready for departure. Pina 2, November Papa, wind 250 degrees, 5 knots, 1 and right, get take off. 1 and right, get for take off, Pina 2, November Papa. North Shuttle 7087, line up 1 and right, full runway, you're number 2 for departure, 1 departure from intersection before you. Line up and wait, runway 1, line right. Number 3 for departure, holding position, North Shuttle 7087. Lining up. And weather is on my side. Traffic on yours, please. Final is clear. Checked. He hasn't started his takeoff roll yet. No, he has. Leaving 1492, contact ground 121 five zero. Ground 121925, can I have 1492? Leaving 1496, are you already on? 26, can I have 1496? North Shuttle 7087, wind 25 degrees, 5 knots, 1 on right, get take off. Get take off from a 1 on right, North Shuttle 7087. Clear take off. Take off, whatever, now 112 whiskey, Alice 26. Evelyn 113 whiskey, good afternoon, continue from 26. Setting thrust.
After a takeoff checklist. After the takeoff checklist complete. Checked. Standard set and crossing 5600. Checked. Now shuttle 7087 clear direct to Kogab. Direct to Kogab. Now shuttle 7087. Direct to Kogab. Norsha to 7087, make it direct Tigba instead. Direct Tigba. Norsha to 7087, thank you. Tigba is probably better, it's to avoid a little bit of weather. Execute. Checked. And Engage auto pilots. Checks. And again, we'll wait with the signs until we are clear of the weather and we can see. Going to one one stop yeah. to the the flight level at one five zero. Stop the flight one five zero. Going to one one parachute jumping below. Copy that, it's going to one and we're going to avoid those ones. Can we three one one, Roger, uh, can we clear? Clear now, scan three one. Yeah, no, 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 we have a, a very good um, tool. If I select COM, I'll, I'll go back. If if my page looks like that, you'll get the ACAS. If my uh, navigation display looks like that, and I select COM, I get a, a new menu. ATC, Flight Information Company, Review and Manager. In this case, I'd like to put in a few reminders. So I'll use my cursor device, push for company, and I got a set of new uh, topics. And I think this one is the most used, in our company at least. And here I can uh, select a reminder for... Three eight zero set. And that's what we wanted, three eight zero three eight zero. Okay, back to the reminders. As you can see, it says times. Here's crew change. So that's obviously very important for us. Time to top of descent, top of the drop, time to destinations, waypoints, latitude, longitude, fuel, altitude. We can put in anything we want. I can, uh, if I, for instance, put in uh, 1300, and I write, uh, Always birthday. So in about uh, 31 minutes, a little less, it's going to be ping and it's going to say uh, Oliver's birthday. Otherwise, we can uh, put in, for, as it uh, suggests, times for the crew change. And we put in, sometimes we have to uh, report something specific to uh, any ATC um, controlling or oceanic control. Then we can put in, for instance, zero long is something that uh, quite often is used. If you go like the east, zero. Then it will, when we pass.
straight through, and it was checked. And I could uh, here put in if, it, if there's a new frequency, HF, frequency most, most likely, or anything. It's a reminders page, and it's frequently used. If I return another one that is pretty much used, but maybe in the end of the flight is the current flight times. It goes on the brakes, out time, off time, means airborne time, on time means landing, in time means when we have blocked in and doors open. And here again, I can see uh, the fuel on board presently. And for the logbook, especially, I need to know how much fuel they had when they blocked in from the previous flight. And that's where I can find that easiest. So uh, people take either pictures of this one for their logbooks or logging of their flight times, or they just print it and have a copy. I'm the old-fashioned one. I'm still using paper logbook, so I use the print, as long as the printer works. And flight information is, yeah, well, I could actually go back and uh, flight initialization, hard word for me to say, is something that we use uh, to initialize the flight so we can upload all the different data like weather and also uh, uh, the route. And uh, like now, we're supposed to do a departure report and see it's already uh, filled out a few of the uh, subjects and data for us. So that we said 73.4, didn't we? 74, and we used flaps five, and I did the takeoff, and if I want to have something extra, I fill out that. Otherwise, I just send it, and then it goes automatically to the um, company. Exactly where in the company? I don't know. One of the computers. And um, I would expect that the, uh, the MCO will be the one, or the, that department, who will use the uh, information that we send. Possibly the uh, off times will be used by um, traffic to have a flight watch on us. Otherwise, something that we frequently use is uh, ATC, and this is a log, I push the log on status. And this is a very nice tool for us. It is uh, the so-called CPDLC, and that makes it uh, possible for us and, uh, and available for us to communicate with uh, ATC without using the radio. Right now, we're not logged on to anything. It says ATC connection not established. And we're going to log on to BIRD, that is Reykjavik, in, uh, in about uh, uh, 45 minutes or so. Trondheim a little bit further out. Try to log on that. So there are a lot of pages, and that's what I think is the most challenging part. Excuse me. RVSM check. 26, 140 now. Check. Uh, review is just if I want to see what has been sent to me or what I have sent to somebody else. It could be flight info like the uh, 80s from Arlanda or what the company has sent to us. In this case, as you see, uh, at 11.08, Oliver did a flight initialization, and then we got the preliminary flight plan as we spoke of before, and then uh, it was displayed, and then we got the weight and balance, and it was accepted at 11.56. Manage is what it sounds like. I manage different things, because we have a lot of communication tools on this airplane. It's so many that we, yeah. Again, you, you need to use it in order to remember, etc. Very hard to sit in your own little room and office and try to uh, make this perfect, I think. And that is about it. Did I say anything else about the flight information? Oh yeah, flight information, that's where we pick up the ATIS. And and before, I, I, you, you use that one, I think. Yeah, you, we can use, uh, from the United States, we can use two ways. If one doesn't work, we can use the other one. We normally send a request to our company who sends us the, the departure clearance. In this case, Oliver used the departure clearance to communicate with uh, the ATC and to get the departure clearance. 
a little bit further to the right, we have the oceanic clearance that we will use in a while, in, in a short time. And uh, again, we use BIRD, B-I-R-D, entry point, where we enter the uh, oceanic area. And what we request as uh, cruising altitude, the flight level, and the ETA estimated time of arrival of this entry point, and the MAC number. They, um, they use the MAC technique to uh, separate aircraft that are not under uh, radar surveillance. So if we are, for instance, getting uh, Mach 0.84 or 85, we need to keep that for the whole crossing, unless we request and are and is approved a uh, different speed. Now, free text, we, um, if we have something else to inform them of, most often it's the maximum flight level that we can take. It's not always the highest that we want to go. Also to be filled out in, in a short time. And that's it. I'll go communication and then I'll return to uh, the navigation display. This is uh, the uh, EFB, electronic flight book of the 787. It is a handy tool. The thing that I personally uh, think about it is that it's not always good when you turn away from the colleague, in this case the camera, but you speak into something else and the colleague sits over there. But on the other hand, it forces me to address my colleague more. This is the menu, main menu as it says, and these two are blue, meaning that I can't select them at the moment. I can close the flight only on ground after the flight, obviously. And when I enter the uh, cockpit, it says initialize flight. So that's what I've done. I have a system page, item page, pilot utilities. These first two are a little bit boring, but needed. This pilot utilities is a handy one. Is basically my um, iPad or iPhone or whatever, because this one has conversion, temperature, weight, length, anything that I also have on, on my iPhone and iPad. I have a calculator, a stopwatch, scratch pad, and this one is pretty good, because it's easier to get uh, confused when it comes to uh, time zones, etc. So here I can select what time I, if I want to have any other time, now it shows me the universal time. If it has daylight saving or not, and then I just select which um, area I want to uh, check. Very good to, uh, to have. And then back to the main menu, sorry, that one. Documents, It's this one is pretty good, uh, often used because we have the MEL, minimum equipment list, or FCOM bulletins, the crew training manual, and here's the guide for this specific EFB. Uh, this one is not being used en route the compression routes. It's not used on this one because they're not that high terrain so that we need the compression routes. The compression routes are, in case there are so high uh, mountains that we need a special route to not, in case we get a decompression, I should say, and we need to get down into higher pressurized air and then we need to follow it a certain route in order to not to hit the mountains easy as that and several others manuals flight folder is not used at this moment the performance page is what we spoke about earlier on ground and on route charts uh, it's a little bit personal what people think of it. Uh, for me personally, I don't see, I don't use it very much. I have, I have my iPad and I have my maps. But it's, it is a handy tool, especially after we have uh, gotten the update, so it actually have a little airplane spot in it, so we can see where we are. Now I am going to, into the terminal charts. Oliver, you have controls. Now I'm going to the terminal charts to tell you a little bit about what uh, happened after we had started up the airplane and we were given the taxi instructions and also the departure route. I go back to uh, to this page. Here are uh, the airports that I have selected. It's the origin, the destinations, and further on I'm going to select alternates, both en route and at the destination. In this case, Echo Sierra Sierra Alpha is Stockholm, Arlanda and I, if it's green in that little square, I go edit clip and I can find all the 
plates for Stockholm. And this is a taxi in and out or information about uh, block-in or coordinates or any kind of stuff. I now have selected Pakistan's departure routes as well as the airport. And here is it, that arrow means SID, Standard Instrument Departures. That one I have selected, the one we were given, Koga 4 over there, Golf. There's a green little tick. I go complete, and now they are selected on my left hand side. They could also be on the right hand side, but it's all depending upon how many I have selected. Here's an overview of uh, Stockholm. I can use my finger to actually touch it. I can use arrows like that, or I can use my TTG on this one. Here it says EFB. If I go, I can get a little pink square. Hope it could be seen. And with, then I can, with this controller device, control my EFB also. Of course, the finger is most efficient and easiest way. Anyway, um, here we have uh, 19 right, 01 left. They also call it runway 1. Runway 0826, runway 2 as they call it, and 19 left and 01 right. Today we used 19 right. You have that up here. Let me focus that a little bit. The longest runway, the oldest runway in Stockholm, and um, we have a little bit of information on this one, but as you can see, it's not very detailed. It is an overview. So in order to get our parking spot exactly, I need to go into parking stands and departure routes. Let me put that away, get rid of that one. And parking and departure, we were parked at 17, right there, Pier Bravo, Terminal 5, Sky City, and I think it's a good way for us to uh, show us a little bit. We, yeah, with the new aircraft and everything, it's, it's not too bad to be seen, so uh, parking spot 17 is a good one because everybody from Sky City sees the aircraft and I think it's good. PR. We got the pushback and uh, of course the pushback tractor and staff, ground staff, will push us with the tail inbound and nose outbound, in this case, west. And we were also given the request not to block in and outbound from the opposite terminal. And that's terminal four, and that's used for domestic flights. And so they did, they pushed that on Zulu Hotel, the extension, and facing west. We have a little arrow there, meaning that you taxi that way and we expected to get uh, straight ahead, second to the right, and follow Yankee. That was exactly what was given to us. So we taxied straight ahead, crossed taxiway Zulu, and second to the right onto Yankee, and we had an aircraft on our left-hand side. And then we just followed Yankee all the way up north to Yankee 10, and now I need to go back to the overview again. To Yankee 10 where we got the uh, lineup clearance, and also we were advised that from Yankee 9, there was a departure. So when we lined up, we could see thin air was on the runway taking off ahead of us. Sometimes that's a little bit, um, uh, what could we say, worrying even for the passengers who are sitting on the left-hand side, because they see an aircraft on the runway, they get a little bit scary sometimes. So one really needs to have a distance in time between you line up and, and um, we take off. It's the longest runway, as I said, and from this runway we got uh, Koga for Golf. That's on that page. And this is a Jepson plate. And I can print this page if, if I want it to be in, in a paper copy. Uh, we try to reduce everything regarding papers so we don't. We have it here, and we, I have it also on my iPad, given to me by the company. So I can... I can um, prepare if I go to a new destination or if it's something else I can always be updated when I enter the cockpit it says Stockholm Arlanda Stockholm Sweden and 
the number and also the date. There is some text information regarding transition altitudes when we can expect to get a flight level instead of altitude frequency and also the minimum safe altitudes around in this case Arland of UR a beacon 19 right Let's see if I can get a little bit better like that 19 right and uh, Koga for golf that's the one we were given in this case we took off 186 degrees to this point as a 705 and that's exactly what we had in our FMC on my right, at my right hand knee, and uh, it says at or above 600 feet when we pass that, so that's an altitude requirement or restriction. Maximum 220 knots, so we're not allowed to fly faster than that, but slower. Slightly left turn toward uh, SA707, that has also a uh, altitude restriction of 1500 feet at or above, max 220. Same speed restriction, a little bit higher. And that's also in the FMC saying, in this case, 1500 with a big B saying, sorry, A, above. If it's if it's said uh, at or below, then it would have been a B. Then uh, we continue a little bit further to the right, uh, 722. In this case, nothing. We could just climb unlimited. And then we were uh, given, about here, we were given direct to Kogav. That's the point, the end of the departure route. As soon as we had gotten that, uh, we saw some weather in this area. But before we even had to take care of it and think about it, she gave us uh, direct to uh, another point, Tibrit. That cleared us of all weather, so that really made us the day. In case, in case we haven't already had it in our FMC, we would have been. Uh, strictly instructed to follow the 250 knots below flight level 100, that's approximately 10,000 feet. And that is for separation or noise abatement uh, procedures. So now we're standing by for receiving the Oceanic. And we are going to request flight level 380, the present altitude that we have, and we're going to request 0.84. Right now we have 0.843, and that's the economy speed for the aircraft at the moment. So actually we're going to reduce if we are given the 0.84 for the Oceanic. But it's such a small amount of speed, so it's at this time it's uh, uh, you can disregard it. 7087 for Oceanic, good afternoon. Are you ready for the Oceanic clearance? But it's copy, no shuttle 7087. Marshall 7087 is clear to Los Angeles via flight plan route, flight level 380, marked a small 84. Read back to Oceanic routing please, up to Point Ingham. No shuttle 7087 is clear to Los Angeles, flight level 380, max decimal 84. Oceanic clearance, 69 north, 0 east, 72 north, pan west, 73 north, 20 west, 74 north, 40 west, 73 north, 60 west, Ingham, North Shuttle 7087. North Shuttle 7087, all correct. Please make a cell call check on HF with border radio. Primary frequency 4675, secondary 88901. Remain also with me. We just got our oceanic clearance from Boda. That's Norway. Sometimes you get it from uh, Reykjavik. From Reykjavik, we can get it on uh, CPDLC or ACARS, but now we got it on the radio, and it followed exactly what we had requested, and it even followed our request for flight level and speed. These are coordinates, uh, Latin longs, that we um, have to follow strictly, very strictly, both to destination, or not to destination, but to that uh, waypoint, and with that speed, and on that altitude. All to uh, separate. The separation requirements and rules are a little bit different when doing the crossing of, of uh, the Atlantic. And these coordinates are very soon to be plotted into this map. And this map is showing us it's actually almost not going to cover. And we will follow and track where we are, what time, 
and what speed so we can see and for uh, the authorities or the company to check up the uh, accuracy of of us and also the uh, navigational equipment. We are flying uh, something that is called random route. That means that the company has chosen these coordinates to become waypoints and they're taken, I would say randomly, but almost. Uh, otherwise there are NAT tracks, North Atlantic tracks, that are decided the day before and they are called Alpha Bravo Charlie Delta or X-ray Yankee, Zulu, etc. And they are fixed. So in case you fly a NAT track, you get in the clearance, fly track Bravo. And then everybody knows what track Bravo is. We don't. We fly, as I said, the random routes. And that's a little bit more special. That. And that's because up here in the very north, there are no NAT tracks. So we will fly out in, in the area north of Iceland coming overhead Greenland, almost in cutting Greenland in two, Sunderstromfjord, and up here it's Thule, the uh, American base. It's probably base, naval, and Air Force it is for sure. And then we proceed in overhead uh, Canada, and um, then we exit the so-called MNPS area and the Oceanic Clearance, and then we fly over mainland all the way down to Los Angeles. But this is a way of uh, keeping ourselves accurately to the, Auto control, to the route uh, afternoon, nice, uh, and, three, four, and seven, uh, level, uh, three, in order eight, to uh, uh, direct, uh, make sure that we are separated from other aircraft. So next step is to plot these coordinates into this map. And next step is to follow follow it up. And also on this map it's it's quite interesting all that these circles are distances from different airports. For instance, here's Reykjavik and and here it says BIKF, that's Ref uh, Keflavik, and it's 1228 nautical miles. That is three hours away from Reykjavik. We are approved of three hours ETOPS. Extended twin engine operations. That means that we are allowed to fly three hours on one engine. And that is required to have that approval because there are not enough airports when crossing the Atlantic. That means also that we are more than one hour away from, from Reykjavik before we are less than one hour from the next airport. The small airports in the south of Greenland is not uh, available for us because of there have not a long uh, not enough long runways or not uh, enough with um, uh, safe and rescue or ATC etc so what we normally use is uh, Shannon Shannon Presswick Laches all the way down here on the Azores and uh, Reykjavik we have Tula but that's a little bit restricted because it's American military and we have um, Goose Bay Gander or um, further up here we have the Churchill, not the best choice, but we still have it. And then further on down to Canada with Edmonton and uh, and we have um, Salt Lake City, that's Northern America and so forth. So it's a little bit restricted and that of course gives us a little bit smaller room to choose between what actions we need to do and take in case we get a malfunction or abnormal uh, situation. So sometimes it could be a little bit lonely. But uh, everybody knows that where we are and that's why the aircraft actually now reports where we are. Or for instance, in this case, we have passed the uh, waypoint Ezola. It's about coming to that. Isla, it should be even further north. And the aircraft, through its ADS system, um, sends the uh, position, the data, the altitude, the time, the fuel, everything, to, in this case, Boda, telling us, here is where we were at this time. 
and the airplane will do that continuously as we pass overhead waypoints. And if it doesn't, they will contact us and say, give a waypoint position report regarding whichever waypoint they need the report for. And that's it so far. For the crossing, we need uh, and acquire weather for our en route alternates. And um, therefore, I go to get some weather weather request. I want the actual weather and the forecast for B I K F for C Y Y R and Kilo Sierra Lima Charlie. Kilo Sierra Lima Charlie. What else do we want? Some other, something else? You want something else? Edmonton is not really in the... Yeah, we can, you know what? We go, we can uh, request, these are the requirements. And then we go for the destination. For airports that are approved for us to uh, operate into, and we select actual and forecast, as you can see, you could actually request forecast one or forecast two or surface action. They are not really interested in this case. Sending. So in a few moments, I hope that it will say calm and we'll get the weather for these four stations and we print it and we keep it in the cockpit. Am I lucky or am I not? We'll give it a few more seconds, otherwise I could continue with something else. Ah, how about that? Isn't that a beauty? I need, to, in order to yeah, check that I have both both the meter and the forecast, terminal area forecast, tough. And then I print it so I keep it, especially since my colleague there, when he comes back, he needs to see and know of it too. So therefore, we this, this could be enough because it's stored in the system, but we want it easy access, so therefore we print it. Print it. Print it in the same format as we just saw. And we can check. Now we don't have the same requirements uh, as before departure. Now it's the normal operational minima that uh, is needed. Before departure we have some uh, excess additional uh, additions to the weather for actually dispatch, dispatching the flight. Now it's just the operational uh, minimus for the each and every airport that is uh, required. So I will take a look at that in a moment. I know it's, it's good because I've checked the weather, of course, before we dispatched. And now back to, um, to the uh, CDU because I want to go on the fixed page and we wanted BIKF, uh, BIKF. It's a, also a very nice tool to have. All Boeing aircraft have it. And we want um, one hour ring and three hours ring. So uh, 429 and that's one hour. So from from this either position either place along this ring to Keflavik is one hour flight time with this aircraft. Secondly, 1228, same 1228 as we had on on the plotted chart, same. So it's basically this ring that I'm not putting out. And there we go. I actually have to have a little bit. There we go. It's a long excess data is because it's so much information on my navigational display as it actually has to cut a few away. So this ring is the same as this ring. It should be in the same location. Next, uh, CYYR. CYYR. And I do exactly the same. 429 and 1228. Same thing goes for for uh, Goose Bay. It's still one hour and three hours that I'm interested in. No difference. Thirdly, 
third en route alternate, Salt Lake City. And in case we get a reroute outside the three hours, or the weather is not good enough, we have to plan and think again. On this specific light today, we are happy to say that so far it looks good. So far we are way within the three hour and the weather is good on all three en route alternates. Okay, and I'm a little bit behind now, but this is because I talk too much. Same checklist as I had on ground. Uh, we, had the, we had done the flight planning and the pre-flight and prior to oceanic entry, this is what we've done. Now we are in the area, but um, I will just show you it. Prior to oceanic entry, oceanic clearance obtained. We did that, FMC position, we checked that. FMC route confirmed, modified if changed. That was not needed. We had the same clearance as we had requested. So the one requested is the one we have in the FMC. CDU fixes uh, that was put in. 180 minutes and 60 minutes. One hour, three hours. Clear flight level and Mach number. We are at 380, 380, and we are on Mach 84. Mach 84. That's what we have in the FNC, and that is what our our current speed is. And HF radio and cell call is checked. So prior to oceanic entry check is complete. Yeah, so now it's plotting time. Hurrah. Okay, established. So now we, we can see that uh, we have communication established with uh, BIRD, with Iceland. So now when Oliver starts talking to them again, uh, he will call in and say CPDLC. So then they can communicate with us or we with them via these systems and on, only on our communications system and without the radio. Cancel. Okay, let's um, let's talk to Iceland Radio and say that we are CPDLC. And Iceland Radio, no shuttle seven zero eight seven CPDLC. Exit point Ingham. Call cool. Echo Kilo Bravo Sierra. Roger, 7087, I can write you copy to CPTFC, exit Ingram. This is the primary, secondary 4675, at Ingram, you call scanned radio. Primary 112799, secondary 88901, here's that call. We're now entering the uh, area, uh, MNPS area, where there's no radar coverage. So then it's really important with our waypoint reports, position reports, and in about 30 minutes, we will change our squawk to 2000, and we will go on an a VHF frequency, one, two, three, four, five, and that's, on that frequency, you can use for anything or everything. And frequently, you can hear uh, scores or people reporting turbulence. As I mentioned before, the ADS, um, is sending the uh, position reports for us automatically and uh, automatic dependent surveillance and it's a really good tool we basically don't do anything but we can check if it has been reported and now i have uh, in front of me presented the ads page that i found find under uh, communication manager and then i select ads this page comes up it says ads arm ADS emergency off. It shouldn't be on because then it, then it says that we are in emergency and we are not. And down here, we don't see exactly what has been reported, only that it has been reported. So we have two um, reports being sent to BIRD, as I mentioned before, BIRD to uh, Reykjavik. And if I'd like to see which at least one of them might be. I'll go to uh, progress page, and here's an actual time of route. This is a position report, by the way, and as you see up here, actual time of overhead, 1356. At 1357, bird waypoint report has been sent, 
Uh, so it has been sent about this specific waypoint. This is uh, magenta. This is the next waypoint. This one should coincide with that one, and it does. 72 north, 10 west. 72 north, 10 west. So this is this is something that we don't use at the moment. This is an old thing. Going to progress. Same again. Magenta, active waypoint. So if we try to stay a little bit ahead now, 1429 is the time that the navigational equipment estimates us to be overhead that waypoint and shortly thereafter we could go back to this page and to see if it says supposed to be 1430 bird waypoint report we can try to remember it and see if that works so uh, it's easy we don't really check it unless we have a problem something that pops up on the ACAS for instance uh, but it's a good way to see that it has been sent and that's it. This specific aircraft environment is really a big difference and different from the previous uh, airplanes, whether I've flown them or not, but it's, um, it's a big difference. It's, um, it's a higher pressure, the differential pressure is higher, so we are actually as if we were on a lower altitude than we would have been in another aircraft at the same flight level. It's also uh, more humid, or more humid, it's, it's, it's less dry. Um, so, for instance, if I have been on the beach for a day, and I will actually stroke my arm, it's not, it's not going to snow. It's actually, I I'm, I'm still have a little bit of body fat, which makes me less dry. And uh, I still should drink a lot of water, but it makes me feel better. And um, secondly, okay, not in here, but in the cabin, the light and the cabin lighting is, is uh, different so that the passengers sh and the cabin crew shouldn't be as tired as they could have been in the old days. So many differences, I would say. And I almost forgot the noise or the lack of noise in the cockpit. What you can see now is that there is a seat behind the camera and I can easily speak to the person sitting in that seat without having any kind of intercom system nor do I need some flag system. I can speak to the person with a normal voice. So, of course, that makes me less tired also uh, during a full day, like today, 10 hour, 30 minute flight time. It's, it's really to the better, for the better. So I do appreciate this airplane, I do. Now you see uh, the hot head up display of the 787. And as you can see, uh, it is presented in green, pretty strong, it is both possible to control it automatically or manually, especially at night time. Everybody wants different light. Somebody wants a little bit sharper, somebody wants it a bit less sharp, so we can do that. And it's basically a primer flight display, as we have on the instrument. And we are supposed to use the HUD at all stages of the flight. It's a very accurate tool and instrument and the thing is if we look in the middle in the center of the whole picture you can see two rings. One outer ring is with um, almost like wings and that one is uh, centered by a smaller ring. The bigger ring with it as I call wings is it looks as if they have wings of a F-4 Corsair from the Second World War, a little bit crooked. That one is the airplane symbol, and in the middle is where we're supposed to go. So if, if those two are centered, then you fly where you're supposed to go. In this case, we are following the magenta and maintaining the altitude. This, the straight line that has 31 to the left, 32 a little bit cut off to the on the right upper uh, side of this ring is the compass. And to the left you have uh, a, an arrow showing uh, not the speed but where the speed trend. If I start to continue uh, from the top, top left, there's an arrow coming from 
little bit to the left and above and showing 14. That's the wind at present altitude and present position. On our navigational display, it's uh, not only the wind velocity that says 14, it's also mentioned 301 in this time. On the HUD, you see only 14. The direction is only mentioned by the arrow and its, its direction, so you have to figure the, the direction of the wind out yourself. In this case, we have a little bit of headwind, and I will s now tell you we have 30 knots tailwind. A quick calculation in my head give, gave me that, almost. And uh, all the way at the top, you have um, the FMA. It says SPD, speed, LNAV, LNAV, lateral navigation, and VNAV, PTH, vertical navigation path. Those are the three modes that the airplane is now flying in. It means that uh, we're at speed and speed from the FNC. We are on LNAV, lateral mode, and that is chosen from the MCP panel, the mode control panel. And that could be easily uh, changed into, um, for instance, heading select. I will now push the uh, heading cell and now it's going to go to a heading. I will just make sure that it's centered, and it is. There we go, heading cell. And you can see a square. And if I would continue on this one, I would in uh, approximately six minutes make a huge error for my navigation. So I immediately go back to LNAV. You see there? And it, now it's boxed. Now it's engaged into LNAV mo uh, mode again. VNAV is the um, vertical navigation, and now it's the following the path, path up or down, and it's, unless I change the altitude, also on the MCP, this will continue to stay on path. Next below, you see A slash P, that means autopilot, it means that we are flying on the autopilot now, and that could be changed to be uh, FD. If I disconnect to the autopilot now, which I'm not going to do, because if I do, we're going to get uh, massive caution and it's going to be sent to the company. And But later on, we could deselect if we're on lower altitude. And then it says F slash D instead. Then there's another compass, a little bit of a compass rose. You have um, like a pyramid and it says H319. And that means that we are heading 319. I can change that one. It's lower on that. You're gonna get the. Uh, should be yeah. That's a heading that keeps to maintain. Hang on a minute. To maintain the uh, LNAV on the magenta line. Further below that, to the left, it says FMC. The FMC is controlling the speed. If I change it, but I can't do that now because we are on Mach number. Then uh, the FMC is controlling the speed. Then you have five. That means plus five nose up five degrees, and you have, um, uh, again, the horizon line, and then below you have minus five, obviously a negative pitch, nose down minus, and then we, of course, go slightly down. The three different symbols below the minus five line is uh, also pointing out our navigational, lateral navigation, and it means that we are actually very accurate at the moment on the, the line here we need to have uh, four the route navigation performance is four but actual navigation performance is 0 0.04 so it's very accurate and you can see that by the, the filled arrow pointing in the middle below you have uh, again the compass rose and now I can if I turn this one out nothing will happen with our our heading, but you see it moves now to the left, and you can also see on the horizon line, now it says 310, I will turn it back, see it moves, it moves both on the horizon line and the compass rose at the bottom of the screen of the of the HUD, and it says, and it says magnetic, a little bit uh, in the, to the right of the middle of the compass rose.
On the left hand side of the uh, rose it says cell HDG321 heading. If I now push track, oh, I'm also on the MCP panel now, it goes to track. It now says SEL TRK321 and also the symbol of the compass rose and the horizon line is changed, it's different. And that is for us to see that we are now in a track mode. It's going to follow the track regardless of the wind. Quite useful if you do a, an approach in autopilot, for instance a circle, circling approach to actually track, to fly a specific track, not only a heading. Very good. All the way to the left of um, the hut, you can see the speed tape. That is an identical copy, except the color, of what I have on my PFD. It says 0 .840 on the top, and, there are, and then there are some brackets, and that's our buffet speed. On uh, our PFD, it, they, that is uh, presented by red dots. And then you have the speed 320, 300, 280, a little bit uh, uh, destroyed, if I may use that word. And then you have a bracket saying 268 with a little arrow pointing at another arrow. And then further down it says 240, 220, and then end of the speed tape. And below it says 0.839. So 839 is the current speed just below 840 that is assigned by the FMC and that correlates to uh, in knots 268. So the bracket saying 268 is our speed, present speed in knots. It's not very accurate and that is because of the low uh, pressure at this altitude. And the bracket is, as I said, pointing with a little small arrow to another arrow on the right hand side of the speed tape and that is the assigned the, the one on the right is the assigned speed and the one to the left saying 268 is the present one so if I now should change my speed the right hand arrow would go up or down depending upon what um, what I select now we are passing a waypoint so you can see it banks a little bit to the left and um, up in the uh, uh, just below the autopilot, you can see that it's turned a little bit less than 10 degrees. Very smooth bank, almost not to be felt by the by the passengers. And I just need to make a little check here when we pass overhead the 73. Checking new heading is 308. And distance is... 18346 180 186 yep checked okay back to the hut and as you can see the heading symbol if you remember what that was if you look at the lower lower uh, picture of the hut you can see the compass rows and the heading symbol is to the right still on 319 so we have a procedure flying Boeing aircraft to put that onto the track bug, which is right there. And that is because if you are being asked, no it's not, it's there. If you're asked by the ATC what present heading is, you just look at the MCP and then you know what the present heading is. It's not needed for navigational requirements, but it's, it's convenient. Okay, that was the speed tape. And now to the right hand side, where the um, altitude tape is, and that one says all the way at the top, 38,000, and then you have a little bit cut off, 38,4, 38,2, and then you have another bracket saying 38,000, pointing at, um, uh, what could we call that? A square, it's not really a square because it's a little bit cut off, but it, it's, let's call it a square. And then below those two, 38, correction, 37.8 and 38, sorry, 37.6 it must be. You can hardly see it. So, uh, cut off. And that's
that's of course, if you look at the brackets, our present altitude. To the left, what I had uh, problems defining is the assigned altitude. I can actually go, and I was going to change, I can actually change my altitude a little bit without, it's not changing now because we are on a Vena path. See, changing, and now I go back to 38,000. So that's where we change the altitude and we can see that we are changing it. Below the altitudes tape is STD. It is standard. It is standard for the pressure. It is 1013.25. And at this altitude and height, it's always this pressure that all aircraft are using, standard pressure, so that all aircraft have the same distance uh, vertically toward each other. And the L stands for left, so we're now using the left system for for the standard or the pressure system. And that is about it. Edmonton Centre, North Shuttle 7087 Heavy, flight level 380, request flight level 400. North Shuttle 7087, clear climb for level 400, report level. Climb flight level 400, will go North Shuttle 7087. So uh, we've just checked in with Edmonton Centre and uh, we informed them we were at flight level 380 and our computer here tells us that we'll get better fuel economy if we climb uh, it says our optimum is flight level 407 uh, but that's not available, the nearest is flight level 400 and uh, they've just cleared us to climb and we've got 1000 feet to go and when we're up there we're going to report back to let them know we're level and that's it. We're now five hours into the flight and uh, we took off in Stockholm with 60 tonnes of fuel. And as you can see here, we've now got 30.2 tonnes. So in five hours and 18 minutes, we've burned approximately 30 tonnes of fuel. Uh, so on this screen, uh, you can see the left and right engine and that's the engine shut off valve and the spar shut off valve. And at the moment, the green lines indicate fuel flow from the left and right main tanks. Uh, the fuel's approximately balanced at 15 tonnes. Centre, North Shuttle 7087. Heavy, flight level 400. North Shuttle 7087, Heavy, Emerson Center, good day, CPDLC, voice reports not required. Roger, North Shuttle 7087, Heavy. Uh, I'm going to go through the uh, cockpit of the 787 Dreamliner. It's not a technical course, but uh, we'll go it step by step. And we'll start as I do when I enter the cockpit and when I sit down. I have mentioned before that I started with the EFB and then I go over to the CDU. But after that's completed, I go a little bit further to the left 
and to my oxygen mask. I'm testing that to, uh, in order to see the flow. Press to test, then reset. At the same time, I will check the oxygen at the system page. And this is an oxygen mask that uh, anybody who has been in a Boeing aircraft uh, recognizes. And it's one that you push, bring it out, put it over your head, and the band will automatically tighten as you release of the red handle. Also, we uh, always keep it on 100% and to a uh, one flow. Next, this is just my iPad and this is just a holder for anything. So that does not belong to the aircraft. This one is a tiller for the nose wheel steering. I can steer the uh, nose wheel with uh, my pedals and about eight degrees, but uh, the tiller is of course a normal standard uh, nose wheel steering. EFP as I said and down here is a very good feature for for us as pilots. In the old days people were really cold, freezing, stiff, they had extra socks, they had extra shirts, but the environment in the 787 is quite good according to me. I can uh, set the uh, heater for my shoulders or my foot or my feet. It says foot but it must be feet. And right now it's set to high, so I reduced them slightly. It's pretty cold outside, it's minus 60, but um, put it about that position and uh, we'll, that will bring me to a good uh, temperature. Uh, these ones on the lower bottom is to uh, set the uh, lighting of the inboard and outboard uh, display. That means the PFD and the ND and the flood. These ones, the upper one is, says chart. That means for uh, the light for my chart and also the work table. I'm not sure that it can be seen from there, but it says work table. And the work table is the thing that I have on my left. That I keep papers, sunglasses, uh, whatever, anything that goes. So I can control that. Another light for controlling what I use is this one, the map and that one is controlling what I have in front of me in my lap or on my control column. While I'm up here, I could um, also show you the, the clock when I push that one. Now that I push that one, the clock and the um, uh, comes up on the uh, in, uh, outboard panel. And it goes away as I stop it, as I reset it. And the third thing is the mic to toggle uh, the uh, transmitting on my radio or ground call for that matter. The other one I have is, is uh, behind the control column, column also uh, very standardized on, on uh, Boeing aircraft. And the third one is down here on the radio control panel. Continuing on the uh, MCP, whenever I get a message, could be whatever, something I have ordered or something that comes from the CPDLC, that message, message comes up here. I can either accept that one, if it's such a message that needs to be accepted. I can cancel it to remove it from the screen, or I can reject it. Here we have the uh, master caution <coughs> fire, and here I control some of the features on the uh, primary flight display. <coughs> As uh, Here we have the barometric settings. That one we have the radio, means that basically used in uh, in automatic landings, low visibility, where we uh, use radio altimeter and radio heights. Take that away. Flight path vector, as the one as we saw on uh, the HUD system earlier on. It's very small to be seen, but it's a little symbol of the aircraft. And uh, that shows us uh, where we're going, but, but it's rarely used by civilian pilots, it's not really, it's good for non-precision approaches, but on this specific aircraft we have other measurements to uh, see that and also to use. Here's a good thing when flying in China. I get the meters. So in this case, 12,192 meters is about 40,000 feet. I actually used that for um, sometimes when I come in to, to see the distance. Parametric settings, 
If I turn that one, and right now it's HPA, hectopascals, and that also comes up down here. In this case, it's 1,000 hectopascals. And if I should push that button, STD, the um, pressure QNH hectopascals will swap into uh, into what the uh, altitude is um, referred to. I can't do that now because now we're on a uh, high altitude on the standard airspace, but we will do it later as we come down to 18,000 feet approaching the Los Angeles airport. And when we do that, we're not gonna use hectopascals, but inches of mercury. So uh, for instance, if it's, uh, if I go back, if it is 1,000 hectopascals and I swap over to inches, that uh, relates to 29.53. And that works at the same way. I push that one, the STD on that knob, and it will revert from standard to inches of mercury. Just it, exactly. Now it's coming back to 40,000. And there it should level off. And steady on 40,000. Very good. Checked. Here it says ND. And that refer to refers to this display. And as being pilot flying, I have the big screen. You see, uh, that has got a little bit smaller because he's got the engine instruments and also the ACAS on his side. I can transfer his one to my side with that one, and then I get the smaller one. But as I said, as PF, I use the big one. So that's a navigational display. Map plan menu same thing up here map plan menu so with this one I can for instance if I go over to the menu and push again I can select different things um, in this case I have selected the vertical standard display that one weather traffic airports and data view our left view our right view our left and the right one is seen over his, on his side but it's back. Oh, there it is. We can take the more detailed later on from that one. And range, frequently used. Right now, 1280. 1,280 miles. So I can see all the way down to, heck, it's just in the neighborhood and vicinity of Los Angeles. And we still have four hours to go, which means I can see a lot ahead. But that also means that it will cut away. In this case, it has cut away all the airports that the FMC has installed and loaded and reverts them to white dots instead. I can go down all the way to range 0.5. And you see it says 0.5, but it's 0.25. So 0.5 is over here. And this one is not used at this time. Uh, other than if I want to check the position, GPS position, or on ground when taxiing, then I want to have the highest possible map of the um, airport in order to taxi more precisely. Back to a better range with that one. And as you saw before on the menu, there was weather traffic and terrain, so I can select it either here or on the menu weather, traffic, terrain. I can also steer and control my weather from uh, from another panel down here. This one is um, more complicated as it looks. Um, multifunctional display, left and right. And that is if I have this one. Now I have my cursor, the pink thing over here. And that one is lit up. If I go over there, it should be lit up as well. I can't do that. Uh, and system page. And I can get uh, a lot of systems. I can go into those ones in more detail later on. 
and turn one into CDU so I can control the FNC from here as well. That's not the procedure, that's not what we do, but we can do if we want to. Info, um, it's uh, very rarely used from me at least. Actually, I've never used it airborne. It uh, tells us what the, uh, the database dates and I can swap if I want to. But as you can see, this one is expired July 23rd, 23rd 2014. So that is uh, expired. <coughs> checklists, this is all electronic checklists. We can also take them later on. And communications, we've talked about that already. And the navigational display. ICAS, Indian Instruments, uh, Control Air Systems. Push on over to his side now because we want a big one. <coughs> Engine display, a full expanded one. And this is a cancer all recall. If I push that, I can see if I have any malfunctions on the ACAS, but I don't have that right now. Here's the mode control panel. We can see that the AP autopilot is engaged. You can see that in two places, one closer to me and one closer to the right hand seat. Auto throttle arm switches, left and right. We have um, two engines and we have two auto throttles. We have two auto throttles on this aircraft. One on each throttle, which makes it possible to perform uh, auto lands with with uh, one engine and on uh, on uh, auto throttle. So we don't have to set the thrust ourselves even when uh, being on a single engine approach or something. Flight director's on. That's the, the cross that we see on the PFD. And right now we have auto throttle on. As you can see, the light is lit up. Climb or continuous um, thrust. Right now it's in climb. We can see that over there. Indicated airspeed, Mach. And this is the speed window. As you know, the uh, IAS or Mach is a speed. And if I, I could actually do that now. If I open the speed window by pushing the speed knob, then I can see it says IS, and I can swap it to Mach 846, and that matches with what we have on the speed tape on the PFD. This is quite useful uh, to uh, be on uh, Vina path, as we are right now, but still be able to control the speed myself instead of that the FNC controls it. Put that one out. XFR means transfer. If we get um, a message from uh, ATC saying a specific speed to be kept, it pops up underneath. It says UL and the speed. Uplink the speed. So in case I want to use that speed, I would then push transfer and that speed will go into the window. This feature goes for the same way with heading or altitude and even for the radio frequencies. LNAV, VNAV are lit up and we can see that that's what we're flying on now. LNAV following the magenta line and in this case we have VNAV path. We could have VNAV speed among others also. FLCH is used for descent but not approach and um, as you can see it's it is blank at the moment because we don't use it as easy as that, that. Flight level changes um, thrust and the thrust go to, goes to idle and uh, it will keep the speed that is assigned either by FMC or by me in this window. Here's a autopilot disengage bar, never used. I'm not sure why it's still there, but um, it is. Next one is the heading. We spoke about that a little bit when we looked at the HUD. Heading, magnetic, or track. Also mentioned before, if we want to use the track, we use that to actually follow a specific course. If you go on heading, we will be influenced by the wind direction and velocity. Below the heading window, we have uh, the uh, button for selecting to go on heading select, and then control our direction and heading. But on the inner, the the bigger scale is it from auto 10 and a few on all the way to 30 and that's the as you can see on this side yeah bank limit it says so if I'm on my autopilot 
now it's selected to auto, so the airplane chooses the bank uh, itself. But if I, for instance, um, am on right of exit for an approach, maybe um, I should go on um, 25 degrees bank, and then I can actually change that one. It's not as good as auto on these altitudes, because then it can also, in auto it could take care of um, the bank and, and since the air is quite uh, thin, it can take care and, and decide what bank angle it should have. Hold, that's the heading hold. If I push that one, it keeps the heading and continues till the uh, fuel is out. So that's not applicable. And you, up here, you have the transfer switch again. <coughs> Excuse me. Then we have uh, vertical speed, mainly used for descents. Could be used for for climb also, but it's not as often as the descent. Uh, the ATC can give us a specific descent rate, 1,500 feet or more, for instance, especially a lot of times in China. And here we can select between vertical speed of flight path angle. Very, very rare to use the FPA, but it's a possibility. And we select VS or FPA with that button. It, it, it becomes illuminated on the um, PFD, M FMA, it goes BS, and I with this little wheel, I can control the descent rate. Altitude, we're at 40,000 feet at the moment. And as I said, the uplink can come up here if they uh, orders us to climb or if we have requested a climb. And this one is, uh, here's a good example, uh, but that will come on to the radio. ADC advised us to contact um, Edmonton on, on center on 1331. So if I push accept now up here, this will go green to begin with when I've accepted it and it's accepted. And then we have down here UL, uplink 133.1. Pat is doing the radio communication, so you just push that. Shuttle 707, Winnipeg, Winnipeg, if I said something else. Okay, it is accepted. We have contacted them. So now I can go cancel. <coughs> and here we can also see that uh, they have transferred us automatically to Winnipeg Center. Okay, so canceling that too. Okay, we were over here by the altitude. Auto and 1000 with 1000. We uh, changed our altitude settings with, by 1,000. Uh, heading, sorry, altitude hold, and then it will, if I push that, it will keep the altitude that I had when I pushed the button. Could be basically any kind, any, any uh, altitude. Localizer, final approach course, is frequently used for approaches. Localizer for either localizer approach or ILS approach. Quite often they say uh, clear to intercept the localizer for any runway. And then I could push that one if I have uh, the correct frequency selected. But we also have another IAN approach which makes us uh, able to do approach with a glide path, almost like a glide slope. and. Um, Lateral navigation at almost as a localizer. Could be a localizer. Very handy and every, yeah, basically every time used for an RNAV or or a VNAV L nav approach. If I get uh, clearance for ILS immediately, uh, not only the localizer, then I could push that one, approach, and then I arm both to capture the localizer and the glide glide slope to. Uh, to the runway selected in the FMC. And that one stays on for the whole approach. Flight uh, director on, same button and toggle switch as the one I previously showed. And there's the other autopilot switch. When selecting the autopilot, either either button, either switch could be used, doesn't matter. And from here and to the right, it's the same panel 
if this is control panel as I just showed. Okay. Um, all the way down to the left, we're still on the forward looking panel. I have the air data and attitude, auto and alternate, PFD, MFD, so I can swap, switch, and um, have them on different pages, on different screens, uh, like this one, if I can change, depending upon if one of the screens are unserviceable, then I can uh, be forced to move in order to see the instruments I need to see. And the handy thing and good thing with that is I'm, by the checklist, I am advised to swap this one so it works, so I, I get good help with that. And down here is the flap limits. If I um, get a little bit hesitant on what the actual speed limits are, I can throw a little, little glimpse on those ones and, and can see. So in this case, to uh, select flaps one, the maximum speed is 250. But that's the maximum. It's better to come down. Very often, in these with these weights, our our clean speed is around 220, 218 knots, something like that. So it's this is a limitation. If I go above it, they have to do a check. And here I have uh, the box. This one is very handy, and uh, it uh, shows what um, what uh, flight number we have selected in the FMC, in this case, NAX, North Shuttle, this is the format that comes up on the flight plan with the um, ATC controllers. The flight number is normally, if you look at the uh, tickets, it's DY, Delta Yankee, 7087, but here it's NAX, call sign North Shuttle. And then uh, Mike is, is on flight. That means I have selected the VHF frequency. If I, for instance, select an HF frequency, it should change there. Accepting. And uh, transponder code. Often we are asked what if to conf be confirm what transponder code we have. And that's very easy to see what we have instead of looking down into our looking down into our, our different uh, screens. And then we have the cell call, spoken about before. Echo Kilo Bravo Sierra is, is uh, set for this specific aircraft. No other aircraft has that one. Tail number, Echo India, Lima, November, Fox. Also the, obviously the only one. Iris registration. And then we have the UTC time, the date, and the elapsed time from liftoff. Also very useful. And down here, we have the screen for uh, all, as you've seen already, there have been some messages coming up, and also if I select, uh, just for fun, let's see if it works, I can select the um, is for LAX, see if that comes. They start, they start we got some turbulence. We are which... Uh, Should be coming. As always, trying to demonstrate something. Yeah, too far away. We can look at that later on. We're going to use it a couple of times. I had oh, large uplink. Select com. That means that um, the eight is for LAX. is very wide. It's like Los, uh, um, New York. Also, a lot of information. So it uh, advises me to select com, and that refers to this com. And there we go. It's two pages. Two pages for for uh, air traffic information, and I can choose just to look at it or print it. But anyway, that was. If it's not that big, it will all pop up on my left hand side. Cancel that one. Clean that one. So the PFD, we recognize that um, from any other Boeing aircraft also, and also we recognize it from the HUD. We have the FMA. Flight mode enunciator, speed, LNAV being a path at this moment. 
and the speed, uh, the set speed, the commander speed is 0.849. Buffet speed, not to be, um, or the barber pole, shouldn't be, uh, we shouldn't go into that one. And we have to make a special check, or it goes actually too fast for the aircraft. And we have the speed tape, the different speeds, and here's the actual speed in knots. And this one is not accurate at the moment because of the thin air. This is the commanded speed, and this is the maneuvering speed. Should also stay out of that one on this. And then we have the actual speed. FNC is controlling the speed. Autopilot is engaged. And here's the, the bank um, bank scale. And uh, pitch up, pitch down. The blue should represent the sky, and the brown should represent the earth and the soil. That means that this is the zero line, so we can see that we have about two and a half degrees nose up attitude while on cruise and while maintaining the altitude flight level 400. So in case we bank, this one goes out, and if it's on auto, as I said before, the, uh, the bank angle is calculated automatically, or if I select it, for instance, 30, it goes either way. Airplane symbol with the wings and the flight path vector. And if we follow the, the sorry, not the flight path vector, the flight director. If we follow that one, we'll also follow the magenta line. Now I had selected manually uh, the uh, altitude in meters, but always presented as the feet, that in altitude in feet, altitude up, down in 200 uh, feet increments, and the commanded altitude present altitude and the standard and saying that we're using the left system and this is if we are now we are smack on track on the magenta otherwise we could see if we are off or left of the of the magenta line how the precision is uh, vertical speed up or down at the moment very accurately zero blank hello we have a, a small scale this, this I cannot change. This we have 10 miles ahead and a little bit of the compass. Um, on the upper left corner we have the ground speed. Right now it's 470 and that's of course calculated with our true airspeed and the wind. True airspeed is 43 so obviously we have some headwind. We could easily check if that's almost correct. Uh, headwind 14. Pretty good. This one says 12, but 47, 482, 276 degrees, 33 knots. So that one should coincide with that one, and it does. Here it says I have my um, weather plus turbulence on, and it's automatic, minus 2.5, so it's actually looking down a little bit. The same information I have over here on the ND. And this one also shows ADF left and right. I still haven't used any ADF or NDB approaches on the 787. Here's another thing we recognize from um, the HUD, selected heading 212. That's what we have on the MCP right now. And we're still right to one of track that we wanted, as we wanted, because we were in the, uh, or are, we are in the uh, zone that we could uh, use to be slop one nolgamized to the right magnetic course. VLN, Victor Lima November, that's the next waypoint. And we have, uh, when we expect the um, time overhead, that's 20.01, Zulu time, 0.4 even. So it's very, very accurate. And the distance to VLN is 97.0, decreasing. VLN is seen here on the navigational display, VLN, same thing. Otherwise, I'm not going to start in that corner. I would like to start in the upper left corner. Again, we have the same thing. The ground speed, the true airspeed, the distance and the velocity of the wind at present, al at present altitude. The range, of the, uh, the range of my scale selected. And all these blue dots with a four-letter code 
there are airports, airports that are actually able for us to use. They are all in the database, so I can I can select them. Map. If I uh, this is what I am in, and this uh, magenta box means which one I am controlling. Plan mode. This is a for the planning. Most often, we use that on ground when uh, checking the SID. The departure route is correct or wrong to find a, a problem, and um, it's uh, north always up. So now we're not flying north, of course, but southwest. So um, otherwise, normally the um, the airplane is flying north. But now we are on plan mode, a difference from the map mode. Otherwise, we have all the Air Canada, 1162 request. 340, do you have any better ride reports? We see 40, 42, 34, unfortunately similar rides, uh, pretty much all levels. Uh, should smooth up maybe north of uh, Swift Current, Yankee, Yankee, November. All right, thank you. Hi, good afternoon, Thunder North Shuttle 787, heavy flight level 400. North Shuttle 707, thank you. We're good. So, in, in plan mode, I get this map centering um, capability, and if I use the cursor and uh, push airplane, I will center the airplane symbol. If I select to uh, push the des des uh, destination, obviously I center the uh, destination. Wrong. Should be in there, and it is. Kalax. Right now, we have a discontinuity between HEC and KLAX, and that's because we don't have any uh, arrival route into the FMC yet. Cursor, not very, there we go. Looks like a shooting range. And center on, this is a pretty good thing to, uh, I will do like that first. Pick a waypoint, I could actually put the cursor, you see it says lat and long, I can put it anywhere. I want to have one waypoint right there. I push the, um, the CCD and up comes um, a um, position, coordinates. And those coordinates also end up in the scratch pad of my CDU. I can now select to remove it, to clear it. Gone goes, bye bye. When being in plan mode, I can uh, go to legs page, and in the lower right corner it says map center and step. So push step, and then it centers the, the next waypoint. In this case, Victor Le Lima November, and also on the legs page of the CDU it says center. If I push step again, like so, it will continue to the next waypoint. In this case, Bravo India Lima. And and on and on and on. Next one up there is uh, is uh, do like this. There we go. Do like that. And now we now we do. Here we go. And um, the menu, the VSD. The vertical situation display, it's very handy and very good when it's um, mountainous terrain, for instance. On an approach, you can see, we see ourselves from the side. And on the left hand of this box, I can just show you, it will, ask, it will go away if I do like, like that, gone. But now I want it. Uh, present altitude, and there's a line all the way over to top of descent, actually. Uh, let's see, it's a little bit early to get the top of descent in there. Yeah. And if there's higher uh, terrain below, we can see that. And on the far bottom, there are distances. So we're talking about approximately 400 nautical miles 
to where we have some high terrain. Do like this. Easiest, fastest way. Weather can turn that one off. Then my my weather stops, and I don't see the weather ahead or the turbulence. Put that one back on. Traffic is the TCAS. And airports, if I push this one, all the blue ones will disappear. Goodbye. For me, I many many of my colleagues don't use this because I, I guess they think it's too uh, cluttered. I like it because I can, as long as I recognize the the codes, it's it's a good idea to uh, uh, for the navigational and situational awareness. Waypoints for just to show it, I take the airports away. Waypoints. Very few in this area, obviously. And stations, that should be a, for a few more. Quite a lot of them. And this is, if, if I'm given um, a waypoint or a station to fly to, I could always do like that and find it if I'm quick. Otherwise, the easiest way is to ask the ATC to spell it out, and then I just write it in the scratch pattern. On we go. Here's the position. As I spoke of before, if I go on a very low scale, I can here see the GPS position. It's constantly moving and updating. And here's the uh, the IRS's position. Not too bad, but not as accurate as the GPS position. I can do that. Go over that. And um, the data is uh, for instance on Victor uh, Lima November we have 20.01 Zulu time and in case I have a altitude restriction that will also be uh, shown on that uh, Victor Lima November I have to be quicker so if I push this one the time will go away further and of course also if I have um, altitude restriction in this case we don't have that so it's therefore only the time shown very handy when, when you're doing crossings or long distance flights, uh, because often the ATC asks us the estimate for for a specific waypoint or a station, and then we could very easy and quickly see what it is. VR left, VR right, and that is chosen automatically, unless I chose to uh, to select it manually. In this case, it. The Victor Lima November is a VUR, and I can unclick that one, and gone it is. But I want it, so I'll keep it. FIR airspace are blue, cyan is not used. Exit is the exit. But I want the airports, so I'll put that back on the screen. Um, here we have the pick waypoint again. It's shown as soon as as soon as the cursor is presented or or on that uh, uh, on the screen on the navigational display so if I go up there bang there it is the cursor and that peak waypoint same as uh, in the plan mode very handy actually um, this is also quite handy to have since we are so accurately uh, positioned from the GPS update of the of our, our uh, position. One has, well, the authorities worldwide has come up with um, requirements for different airspace, if it's approach or if it's just crossing or if it's through a, a normal airspace, if I may disrespectfully call it that one. RMP required navigational performance is right now 2.0 nautical mile. The actual that we have right now is 0 0.03. Very accurate, no problem. Uh, we have a ring over here, that's probably because we have a fix, is that one? C-U-I-Y-R, okay, so let's see, yeah. The ring, the green ring over here is because we have that uh, position in the fix. Is that used for anything? I can take it away, delete. It went away. Next we have the um, uh, backup instrument, and so far I haven't been forced to use it. 
it is basically the same but very uh, less uh, modern I could say as the primary flight display we have the same we have the same symbols speed tape altitude tape standard for the uh, altimeters and we have the bank scale we have the compass scale we have the earth the soil and we have the we have the um, sky uh, this is for the lighting plus and minus nighttime approach if I push that for the approach I will also get the uh, symbols for ILS approach or whatever approach I do. Hectopascals or inches of mercury that will be used later on. If I push that one, I will change the standard to uh, the QNH settings or the inches. And this is the attitude reset. Not very often used. Gear up or down. And in case there's a problem, and here's the limitation of 2 to 70 knots. Mach 0.82. A lock override, if there's a malfunction of any kind, we can use that one to still get the gear up. Alt uh, alternate gear, now it's normal, guarded in normal. And down, cabin call. Here's the auto brake. This aircraft is equipped as many other Boeing aircraft. Uh, as Boeing airplane and, and all modern aircraft have um, auto brakes, very efficient and improves the braking and the wear and tear of the brakes as well. Longer uh, cycle, life cycle. R2 stands for ejected takeoff. This is set by the uh, uh, first officer or the person in the right hand seat before takeoff. And that means that at uh, 82 knots, if, if we reject above that speed, it will automatically decelerate the aircraft to a complete stop. Quite, quite harsh. It, it's really, uh, it stops really effective. Off, obviously what that is, disarm and auto brake one, two, three, four, and max auto. And of course we have the manual brake as well, but that's not an auto brake. These are different settings. One, it decelerates more slowly than max auto. Short runway, slippery runways, etc. Max auto might be necessary to use, but um, along dry runways, one, two, or three is most commonly used. Hi, uh, my name is Derek Stone, and I am currently a flight attendant for Norwegian Airlines, working on their Dreamliner, the 787, manufactured by Boeing. Right now, we're going into the second service of a 10-hour and 30-minute flight from. Stockholm to LA. So right now we're just doing uh, the coffee and tea right now. We're setting up the second service, which is uh, right now it's a ham and cheese sandwich. Comes in this nice little, nice little box. Comes with a yogurt, some orange juice. It's easy to put together. No hard maintenance or no hard work. Uh, right now, the aft galley in the very back is preparing um, for special service with vegans, diabetic, uh, gluten-free meals, as, uh, uh, such as. And then we'll start together and we'll start doing the second service together. Um, working for Norwegian Airlines is very fun. Uh, I used to work for... Uh, United Express and I came also from Delta Connection and I absolutely love working for Norwegian Airlines. They, they're like family. Um, great benefits, they treat us well, they just want you to have fun, do your job. Uh, don't be conservative, just always have a smile, be yourself and that's what I love about working for Norwegian. They just want you to be you and just have fun with what you do. Uh, I've been a flight attendant for a total of six years and I absolutely love it. I wouldn't change my mind.
Park Shuttle 7087. At contact Salt Lake Center 135.77. Uh, 13577, North Shuttle 787. Good day. Uh, up the road, we're probably still going to need to deviate right, of course. Delta 1932, Roger. Good afternoon, North Shuttle 787. Have a flight of 437. North Shuttle 7087, Salt Lake Center, Roger.
to Bravo Lima Delta and to Heck. Got it. A little bit changed. Um, Prince, they're yeah, possibly a little bit tired, but and a lot of traffic. Otherwise, uh, weather is good and nothing special. Hello, Senator. Good afternoon. North Shore 787 Heavy, flight level 322, descending uh, 502 Volta. North Shuttle 7087 LA Center, Roger, cross Graham at flight level 190. Cross Graham at flight level 190, North Shuttle 787 at 190. Okay. Shuttle 4402. Yeah. North Shuttle 7087 Heavy, descend via river to arrival and cleared. ILS runway 25 left approach, altimate 2995. 18-3, we have set and cross check. North Shuttle 787 Heavy, reduce speed to 250. Do you think the speed 350, North Shuttle 787? 250 knots. Please. said we had 250, yeah, so we know. American 139, cutting approach, 124.9. American 139, good day. North Shell 787, heavy contact approach, 128.5. 128.5, North Shell 787. 128.5. Approach North Shuttle 7087, uh, heavy, descending on the river sea. North Shuttle 7087, heavy, suit cal approach, thank you. And we're speed restricted 250. It would. At 1569, continue right turn heading 230 to intercept your straight and final. Follow that Delta jet to the airport. Right. He's for the inboard. You are cleared visual approach 24, right? Looking for the Bonanza, compass 5815. 5814, I should say. Checked. 1569, tower 133.9. We'll see. 
5814 has a banana. 5814, thanks. Uh, after Santa Monica, descend 18, 3000. After Santa Monica, descend to maintain 3000, compass 5814. Or shuttle 7087 heavy, you can resume normal speed. Normal speed, no shuttle 7087 heavy. Normal speed, check. How far out are we? 285, We're actually on hold. Flaps one. Flaps one. I'm keeping the speed a little bit. For today, we're 1510 with you. Uh, 9800 for 7000. We have Bravo. Ship 1510, SoCal approach after Santa Monica, the 718, 3000. After Santa Monica, 3000, we're 1510. Got a slide, slip live. Shut. Or shuttle 7087 heavy, contact Los Angeles Tower on 133.9. 133.9, no shuttle 7087 heavy. Flaps 5. Los Angeles Tower, no shuttle 7087 heavy. No shuttle 7087 heavy, Los Angeles Tower, good afternoon, phone and Embraer 175 at the other marker. When 260 to 14, runway 24 right, clear to land. Clear to land, runway 24 right, following the traffic, no shuttle 7087 heavy. Gear down. Guide 1569, cross runway 24 left and contact ground point 65. Flaps 20. Travels 4190, contact, circuit of fire, chicken in. Radio. 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 Manual. Canada 796, 126014, Rotary 24 left, sir. Perfect. Take off. Flaps. Let's take off 24 left, Air Canada 796. And landing checklist. Set speed 142. Okay, landing checklist. Cabin call given. And landing checklist complete. Checklist complete. Over to departure 796, yeah. Cover 5814 left at Zulu Cross, running 24 left and contact ground point 65, traffic will hold on position. Good day. Left at Zulu, clear across 24 left and uh, ground on the other side, Cover 5814. Good day. Yeah, 6510, Los Angeles, turn left at Victor, runway 24 left, line of way, traffic crossing downfield. Turn Victor, 24 left, line of way, yeah, 6510.
Okay, 6 5 10 on Abdel Ray, 1 2 5 0 1 3, runway 2 4 left, clear for takeoff. Runway Abdel Ray, 2 4 left, clear for takeoff, Target A, West 15, 10, Swift, you on the visual, 2 4 right. West 15, 10, Los Angeles, good afternoon. Runway 1787, short final cash, runway turbulence, 1 2 6 0 1 3, runway 2 4 right, clear to land. Turtleland 2 4 right, West 15, 10. Minimums. West 58, 16, Los Angeles, good afternoon, turn left with Victor, runway 2 4 left, line up north. I was 5816, Lawson, yeah. uh, sorry, uh, go ahead for 5816. I was 5816, runway 24 left, yeah. line of point. Line of point, 24 left, come Nine of bricks, 60 knots. Central 7087, heavy turn left at Alpha Alpha, cross running 24 left and contact ground point 65, traffic is holding in position. Central 7087, heavy turn left on the Echo, hold short Echo 11. Turn left on Echo, hold short of Echo 11, no shadow 7087. Left Echo, hold short ele uh, Echo 11. Singapore 11 one Super, monitor tower 133.9er. 1339, Singapore 11 one Super. Ground to those Super 282 Super, we're uh, on Sierra, just holding short Delta. We're just awaiting our final figure still. Westjet, 1510 LA ground left on Echo, what's your gate number? holding, the truck is holding. Ground Legion 332, gate uh, 33 Alpha, push and start. Legion 332, LA ground, hold on the gate. It'll be a minute, I got traffic pulling on the gate behind you. Okay, well hold on the gate, 332. Southwest That's 751, big, pushing back, six. So 751, LA ground, Bravo, current pushback approved. Thank you, Southwest 751. Okay, one, two, three. Um, so this is the runway that we landed on, 24 right. The north is that way, and the sea is that way, straight out. 24 left, so we taxied off on Alpha Alpha, crossed 24 left, used Echo Taxiway back. At first we had to hold short of Echo 11, that's there. But before we came to Ele Echo 11, we were given further tax instructions to continue to Echo Delta 10 for stand. And our stand is one, two, three, at the uh, northern end of Bradley Terminal. And uh, uh, so we taxied Echo Delta 10, turned a little bit further, nor uh, further to the right, and straight in. And that's where we are right now. Over here we have two five right, two five left, and they are just named differently, but otherwise their direction is exactly the same as two four left and right. So they are, they have a good capacity here in Los Angeles, can have a lot of movements per hour.